Good morning and welcome to the Nutritional Growth Solutions Investor Webinar. I'm Chloe Hayes, the Investor and Media Relations Manager, and today I'm joined by CEO Steve Turner, who will provide an update on the company and engage in Q&A. And to ask a question throughout today's um, webinar, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Steve, I'll now hand over to you. Thank you, Chloe. Thanks everybody for joining. Wanted to spend a little bit of time walking through our most recent quarterly report and talk about everything that we've accomplished uh, since starting on this turnaround journey in March and hopefully help address any questions and answers that uh, people have along the way. So really from a highlight, perspective, you know, we set out on a journey in March to basically try to find a way to turn the company around and get it positioned for um, its ability to stand on its own two feet and continue forward and grow on its own merits. Um, so our goal was ultimately to get to cash flow positive by year end um, or early in the first quarter, and we're still on that pathway. Um, the company's operations um, and our business channels remain unaffected by the conflict in Israel, although our hearts and concerns are with our team and uh, team members and fellow friends and family that are over there affected by the conflict. Um, obviously, our whole point here is to continue to grow business, grow the sales levels in order to control our costs and, and keep things moving forward at an um, aggressive pace. So it was important to note that um, traditionally this time of year for us, historically, if you look back over the last several years that we've been selling Healthy Heights um, as a brand, that typically just after the start of the school year and just before the holiday season starts is usually kind of a quiet time for sales. And so my original expectation was to try to maintain sales um, and or show bare, bare modest growth month over month, month ever since we started making aggressive cuts to our overall operating expenses. And that's the key important um, element for me here is to actually share the fact that we did actually have um, not only stable sales, but a slight increase in sales in a period that were typically not um, very big. Um, and then of course, our sales momentum is continuing. So our sales with our core business of Kids Protein at Walmart is healthy and ongoing. Uh, we fully expect to see future store increases for items that we have in distribution and also the ability to potentially add additional items within that particular set. We successfully launched, so past tense, a new item in a new department. So we're now in numerous doors at Walmart in two different departments with a nice diversified assortment. Um, our original expectation for Happy Tummies when we launched was 795 doors, and we had a pleasant surprise of over 850 stores on launch, and that's actually happened. So we're seeing sales and repeat sales already, uh, and that's going to be a nice incremental lift to our base um, level of sales that we have in the business. Um, our onboarding is completed with CVS, and we're looking forward to an early first quarter program where we will have a display vehicle that helps us sort of be first mover within the traditional nutrition set by having um, visibility on children's nutrition. And we're gonna be one of three brands in that particular assortment. So it's a shared collaborative effort, but more importantly, just gives us additional incremental distribution in another retailer in 24. Um, we've completed iHerb onboarding and we've already received our initial orders. Uh, our original expectation was gonna be in the neighborhood of around $10,000 worth of opening orders. Pleasantly surprised that actually our opening orders were larger. Um, they were closer to $30,000. We actually had $26,000, $27,000 worth of um, order revenue coming in on that opening order for iHerb. That we also are pretty excited about because it gives us, again, incremental business. It's an e-commerce play that is low risk and it allows us to then also raise um, visibility on the brand and markets that we currently don't participate in. Uh, and then, of course, it's not like we're not talking to other retailers. I want to make sure everybody's aware that those are ongoing and active all the time. So we have regular discussions with um, large regional, national, um, and multinational grocers, um, uh, drug channel stores, as you would expect, other than CVS, uh, and additional mass merchants. And as we continue to demonstrate success with our brand at Walmart and on Amazon and with iHerb and eventually with CVS, we'll have more and more of those come to the table. So that's ultimately going to be our continued path. So... The big thing that we've done since March was dramatically cut operating costs. We want to restructure and create a business that has the ability to stand on its own two feet. And that's basically what we've done and where we're moving. So our staff costs are down um, compared to the previous period. 
Um, we have the departure of our former CFO, full-time CFO, and we now have an appointed fractional CFO who's actually been the man behind the scenes on our financial um, documents for the last five years. So he's extremely familiar with the business and it was really easy for me to basically make that simple pivot because he and I live and work close to each other and it just um, helps, again, save costs on operations. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and bring up a reference of our quarterly financials, because it's the one piece that's missing. And I wanted to sort of talk through sort of the core pieces of um, each of these highlights. So our goal ultimately is to be cash flow positive by the first quarter. The fundamental driver for this, of course, is our ability to operate lean um, and also have the right level of inflows um, in order to offset our burn. So our core goal right now is to see um, ultimately about a $300,000 a month in gross monthly burn. That's basically the point that we've gotten to now that we've turned um, through all the um, operational costs that we had in the first half of the year. And by having an operational gross monthly burn of around $300,000 means that we really only need to bring in north of $350,000, $360,000 of total top line revenues in order to break even. Uh, and our core base business was already fairly close to that level. And that was before we bolted on the launch of Happy Tummies. It was before we bolted on our new incremental business with iHerb. And of course, it is before what we anticipate doing with CVS in the first quarter. So sometime over the next short period of weeks or months, we're going to get to a point where our overall revenues exceed our burn. And that's, of course, why we're pretty bullish um, about stating that we're going to get to that cash flow positive position um, in the very near future. Um, our operations continue to be focused in the U.S. Uh, we are still housed and operate out of our San Diego corporate offices, and the vast majority of all of our revenues come from the U.S. market. Uh, and of course, that's going to continue to grow into other markets, but just wanted to reiterate that we're not affected um, by the conflict because the vast majority of our um, operations are here in the U.S. Now, we are constantly talking and constantly aware and um, wanting to make sure that we are um, considerate of what's going on. And of course, it's meaningful and material to us because of our colleagues, our founding medical team, the Schneider Children's Medical Center in Tel Aviv are still very much an important part of, of what we do. So um, we just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that the company is okay. However, we do extend all of our condolences and feelings to those affected in the Middle East. We've demonstrated consistent growth in cash receipts. I wanted to spend time to sort of focus on this record historical of essentially what the U.S. business has done since it started. Uh, and of course, the trend line is going to continue on this path where we will look to basically continue to drive uh, revenues up above $340,000, $350,000 a month is our goal, um, which then, of course, takes us to that future period very near future period of being break even or cash flow positive. So again, just wanted to point out that while we've had fluctuations in others, the vast majority of the fluctuations that we've had in the past have been in markets outside of North America. Uh, and that's really why we're gonna continue to focus on what we're doing here. So the story is the same. You're gonna hear it from me time and time again. Our core focus needs to be support the brand and find additional points of distribution, support the brand at Walmart, which will then lead to additional points of distribution and grow our business. Uh, we are on pace to eventually get to some larger total of up to 3,500 stores for Walmart, which is a third of the entire marketplace in North America. Uh, we want to expand our product lines and have more than just the one item in the one department. So we've already developed multiple items. We're now in two departments within the footprint of Walmart. There are third and fourth other departments that we have our sights on for future distribution as well, because that then again gives us a diversified footprint amongst a different um, assortment of merchant teams and allows us to then minimize risk as we continue to grow. Obviously the next step beyond that is to gain distribution with other retailers, which we're already on pace to do. So like I said, and like we like to remind everybody before, we have CVS onboarding completed and that'll be in the first quarter. Um, we have regular and active ongoing discussions, and the rest of them are all lining up just on the calendar of what the retailers are used to operating under. So our sales velocity off shelf with our core business continues to grow. Kids Protein and our Happy Tummies now is contributing to the mix. Uh, so I wanted to basically give everybody an opportunity to see what we've already accomplished there, but more importantly, ask questions as we get into the Q&A section of the webinar. 
Um, and in the end, our future goal is to try to get to multiple flavors, multiple formats, um, and more importantly, a larger increase in our footprint. Um, we will be hearing in the near future what the reset um, marching orders will be for next year. Uh, and the two major calendar dates that we will be operating in and around for Walmart will be in the May era for week 16 and in the September area for week 32, um, which are the two resets of the departments that we're in at Walmart. And of course, CVS is exciting for us as well. That's going to be a program that, again, allows us to generate display and visibility. And uh, ultimately, the long-term goal there is to demonstrate success and unlock all of CVS. So we're starting with a small footprint, looking at the alternative formats. More likely than not, it will be somewhere between two and 500 doors. So similar scale to what we started with Walmart and ultimately then building towards a much larger relationship with more points of distribution. iHerb, as I mentioned, is active and ongoing. So our opening orders ended up being larger than we anticipated, which is good. Um, and I fully expect that there are going to be a variety of things that we can do to drive business at iHerb. Um, iHerb in reality in my past companies with past brands has been a fairly sizable fraction of what that particular brand does on Amazon. So I have pretty good expectations that we should be able to drive iHerb to a million dollar or more account over the next 12 months, which again is important because it's incremental revenue, increases our ability to manufacture larger batches, cost of goods will continue to improve, but more importantly, generates revenues. And then of course our core business, which is Amazon and our direct consumer NGS Healthy Heights web store, um, really are the bread and butter for our company. They continue to grow. We continue to see week over week, month over month, year over year performance improvements in our business. And it's a nice mix between having a, a core portfolio where we get near instant revenues from our Shopify channel, uh, as well as the ability to just play with the scale that's available on us um, for Amazon. Um, as far as overall operating costs, again, our cash burn has gone down and will continue to go down and settle in um, as it is right now, roughly about $300,000 a month in core burn, which is a dramatic reduction from where it was previously. Uh, and then that gives us the ability to then be able to stand on our own two feet and march forward without the need of raising any additional capital as it relates to our current operating plan. Um, so again, um, board management changes in, over recent months with bringing Rob on board officially as our fractional CFO. He's been with the company since July of 19, so he predates myself uh, and, of course, has been heavily involved um, in our financials um, and in the business from that point forward. So he was a simple and easy logical step for me to be able to point um, um, somebody to help me achieve what we need to achieve. So at the end of the day, um, that's sort of the quick and dirty summary of the quarterly. And at this point, I'd love to open it up to questions um, that anybody may have. All right, thanks, Steve. Yeah, let's jump into some Q&A now. Um, our first question is, with Happy Tummies stocked in Walmart stores in September, how is how are the initial sales performance? Well, the initial sales performance are good, um, but it's a blur because we had a massive infill and I, I see all of that order flow at the same point as I see individual unit sales. Uh, and so what I don't have a handle on is how rapidly the overall off-shelf velocity is changing, but we are easily meeting expectations, which are low for that particular department because it's in the supplement space as opposed to the food feeding space. Uh, but so far, so good, actually. As a matter of fact, I had to pull forward one of our manufacturing batches in order to have supply so we didn't worry about risking any out of stocks. Um, and what's also important is as exciting as it is to have it on Walmart, Walmart wants us to have a full Omni experience everywhere, meaning that it's also on Amazon. It's also on our healthyheights.com store, and it's also going on to iHerb store. So it's going to have a pretty interesting um, accelerated period over the next few months as it basically is going to be put into multiple channels in order to capitalize on the value that product brings. Right. Um, our next question is, as onboarding is now complete with CBS alternative formats, uh, when do you expect to know the number of stores which will stock Healthy Heights products? Well, we'll find that out in the, early in the first quarter because they doing the onboarding is the biggest time eater, time consumer, anytime they're looking at working with a new vendor. Uh, and so I will get a good handle in January, ultimately what that final count is going to look like and what the overall display metrics are going to be because I'll have to, we'll have to fund as a company, our pro rata share of that display vehicle. And we also will all, all three companies will have to agree on this, the verb, verbiage on the signage. 
um, which is going to be fairly simple, but all, all three have to sign off on it, obviously, in order to make CVS happy. And so I'll know more in the first quarter. So it's going to go fairly quickly from that point to actually being in market because it's, like I said, it's in their alternative formats, which is realistically going to be between 200 and 500 stores. It's not going to be all 1500 because they don't have that room for that type of a display in all 1500, but we'll know more early in the first part of the year. Well, on that note, is there an opportunity to be stocked in CVS pharmacies that is in addition to the CVS alternative format servicing the Hispanic community? There always is, um, but that's not the plan. The plan always subject to change because merchant teams sometimes do that. Um, ultimately, the expectation is alternative formats under this particular merchant team, which is what they have control and influence over. Um, and then as that program progresses, as soon as corporate either is comfortable or gets wind with the long-term plan, that's a point where we would then start looking at a chain-wide relationship. Um, but it's going to be a pretty big jump because it's not going to be just CVS, EMOS in the alternative formats and only select stores in the South. It'll be all, right? So when the way CVS is going to think and the way it works is typically going to be, okay, here's going to be our sort of performance modulars and they have the health hub footprint that they can work within, which are the subset that have the wellness stores within their brick and, you know, large box stores. Uh, and then they have the more mainstream format. And so it's going to be a combination of which one of those make the most sense. But on the plus side, that's the path that we're on. Obviously we'll start small, demonstrate success with alternative. And then the expectation is start the journey to 8,800 doors later. Right. Is the strategic restructure to reduce costs now complete or are you actioning further changes to operations and headcounts? Well, the, the big pieces are done. Uh, the financial benefits from those big changes um, are finally starting to settle into our financials. Um, there are little things that are happening over the next month or two that are going to add to the benefit. So, for example, uh, we downsized or restructured our lease with our existing um, office space here in the U.S. And that'll give us another cost savings of a few thousand dollars a month um, by moving into another suite right across the hall that still allows us to operate same address, same location, so on and so forth. And that's a little bit, I know it doesn't sound like much, but all these little things do add up. But the big ones are done. So the vast majority now is we've cut to basically the core team. Um, and then as we turn the corner and start generating profits, then it's about rebuilding and investing the profits that we do make back into trying to get to accelerate. Because, of course, we're walking a lean walk. We're walking, not running. And so it'd be nice to be able to then have the resources as we grow to basically reinvest in order to create some momentum. Okay, great. Um, our next question is, so when you talk about gross monthly, monthly burn of 300K, does this only refer to expenses and not take into account revenue? Yes. So that is basically the bonfire we light every month to warm our hands uh, in order to basically pay all of our operating expenses, all of our payroll expenses, um, rent, lease, legal expenses, ASX listing fees, so on and so forth. Uh, and so that's, again, why when you look at the top line revenue that we need, the delta between the two, of course, it's not just simply 300K. We got to allow for basically that net receivables, cash discounts, so on and so forth, and get to that point. But that's, um, yes, just a gross monthly burn as far as our OPEX. Um, is there an option to develop further products with Walmart? Um, always is. As a matter of fact, we were awarded uh, and participated in an open call yet again this year uh, and presented products that they haven't seen or that if they had seen, they weren't um, on the right eyes. And so there's always the opportunity there. So the nice thing about being a US-based business manufacturing predominantly out of the US and being a small emerging business, we have the luxury of sort of checking some of those esoteric boxes that Walmart has. Uh, and there's always gonna be an opportunity for us to be able to then come back in and suggest new products ultimately that um, we can get into distribution in the future. Right. Um, are there any promotional activities planned within Walmart to further increase the rate of sales? And how is NGS using influencers to build traction? Well, two parts of that. Uh, so the, the promotions, yes. So there's actually a variety of different programs. There's actually programs that we do with Walmart where they take money from us and we fund um, physical events within their ecosystem. So on walmart.com, in-store, 
um, with their core market makers. Um, and then there's also a variety of tactics where we spend actually more money to drive into the Walmart ecosystem. So we do a lot of spend with Google. We do a lot of spend with the meta universe. So that's going to be Facebook and Instagram. We do a handful of different types of tactics in order to basically drive eyes into that market. And that's done partly with social influencers. So to answer both of those at the same time, what's interesting about Walmart is we actually have a bucket, a repository of about a dozen or so core influencers specifically set up to be Walmart influencers. And so they're, that's their game. And so that is in play. There's actually a lot of content that um, we have available that you'll see in the, in the market if you were and had eyes on it here, but it's available also on our corporate YouTube channel. So that you can see not only the TV coverage where we get with earned media exposure on broadcast network, but you can also see some of the examples of the social media content that we have out there. There's a lot of really great, rich, engaging content that our users are generating. Um, it's fun to watch because, of course, it involves kids and who doesn't love kids? Um, and there's a whole host of content that we use both in that particular market segment as well as elsewhere in order to basically drive visibility. That's the name of the game. Uh, and you know, our influencer buckets range from what you will call micro influencers that maybe have single digit hundreds to low single digit thousands of followers all the way up to the macro influencers that are much more what you would call a traditional key opinion leader. Um, and it's an interesting mix because we have people constantly reaching out to us that a variety of different walks of life that like the brand or have found us um, that ultimately oftentimes more than not asked to be associated in some way. So we have... Um, affiliate networks where we have influencers that have audience that are driving sales and actually get a percentage of the profits from the transaction, which is a great way to also help reward your influencer pool. We have um, medical professionals that, of course, are doing it because they feel that what we offer is the best product for their patient base. We've got dietitians, we've got sports stars, we've got actual target demographic kid athletes that are, are in our influencer bucket that are all generating content. And we reprocess, repackage, and sort of recraft a lot of that content and actually use it for advertising purposes as well as for marketing purposes just to drive visibility of the brand. So Steve, when are we likely to see other large US retailers in addition to Walmart start stocking the products? Well, again, it's all at the pace of the calendar of what retail operates off of. So they touch their categories one time a year. We have the opportunity to basically demonstrate success and get in front of them and then begin the conversations and get to that future point where we get the distribution. And that's all going on behind the scenes right now. So next year for us, I fully expect that we will be bolting on, in addition to what we're doing at CVS, another large national retailer, um, likely a handful of what I'll call super regionals. Uh, and then as we go over the next 18 to 24 months time, the ultimate goal is to try to build awareness with the brand and generate enough support to, to sustain roughly 60 to 70% penetration into the market, which would require a couple large national drug retailers, another mass retailer, um, smaller scale than Walmart. Um, and then of course, a handful of grocers sort of in the likes of the Kroger's, the Albertsons, the Safeways of the world, uh, and basically be where we need to be. And then it's a matter of assortment and support in order to get more items within the, within the set, as well as um, generate the off-shelf velocity we need to make money. Does NGS still plan to launch products in Australia? Oh, absolutely. So now it's a function of resources. The core uh, mantra for me is to continue to beat the drum and focus on what we have that's going to get us a future and get us to that growth mode. Um, but absolutely expect to look at both import as well as direct in-country distribution of the Healthy Heights portfolio. Um, how we get to that point will require some time digging through what are the regulatory guidance requirements we need in order to sell a food for special medical purpose or a supplement within direct distribution in pharmacy. Um, and or in Australia. And then there's also the ability to do last mile fulfillment out of our export hubs and, and start to accelerate what could be done on amazon.com.au. Um, but all of that is in the plans and those will move quickly as we sort of turn the corner. But right now it's stay disciplined and get to that point. And then, um, then the rest of it will start playing in place. And so is the US the main geographic region making online purchases through the Healthy Heights web store? Not, well, it is the main. 
Um, but we do have um, sizable business going north of the border up into Canada, as well as a handful of um, orders going south of the border. The logistical challenges there is really more about the duties and tariffs and how we do that final fulfillment as far as the shipping is concerned. Oftentimes we'll get large orders because they have to offset the shipping costs. And so instead of buying one or two bags at a time, for example, they'll buy six months worth of product all in one fell swoop because then they can manage or amortize their costs across all of that product. But that's definitely a future area of opportunity that we have yet to unlock to find ways where we can greatly improve either the time or reduce the cost to servicing customers that we have in other markets that want our product. Um, and of course, with iHerb coming on board, that's going to give us an additional asset opportunity because we can now lean in and actually route our international order interest directly to the iHerb portal. And then the fulfillment costs and purchase activities are much less than us trying to do them here from U.S. soil. Uh, and so I do expect that that's going to be one of the areas we'll see some sizable growth in our online sales is through our partnership with iHerb because they now, in a sense, become our facilitator. Um, and I'm happy as long as the sale's happening, whether I'm selling it to iHerb and they're selling it to the customer or we're doing it direct because at the end of the day, the product gets in the consumer's hands and just helps grow the overall top line revenue. Well, on that same note, um, do you plan to expand into Canada with any in-store presence? We do, yes, but that is um, something that companies often struggle with. So I've seen historically this challenge in the past. And if you go into Canada with the expectation that it's going to be a big profit center, um, oftentimes you learn that that's not the case. Um, typically, you try to run your Canadian business as break even at best um, because the provinces are so far apart and the cost of getting product distributed across the entire entirety of Canada is very expensive. Um, and then the process, of course, getting it approved through Health Canada, getting your NPN number, which is equivalent to having your drug registration, but even for supplements, you're required to have registered sales, much like in Australia through the TGA, is a costly endeavor. Then you have to have your package in dual languages. You have a lot of all these challenges ultimately that are costly. Um, and so it's gonna be a matter of looking at how do we do that and when is their time right for us to then be able to do it in a way where we don't lose a ton of money um, and we hopefully break even or better. Um, and that's sort of the journey that we're gonna to need to figure out in a future period. But for now, we have the ability to service customers interested in our product directly from the US. It's just expensive for them. So the um, pool or our ability to convert at the last minute is a little smaller than what I'd like to see it. But um, those are all solvable challenges without having to go all the way through to manufacturing, distributing and producing products specifically for Canada in Canada. Okay, and so now looking ahead, once international sales through the web store grow further, do you plan to have multiple global dispatch centers? That's ultimately long-term for sure. You know, one of the benefits that this brand and that this product line has, which we've capitalized on here in North America, is the ability to basically localize it in each of these geographical opportunities. So I do fully expect to have manufacturing that we will control and manage on our own in Europe. Um, that will give us access to the various European countries where there's opportunity. Uh, same with everywhere else that you can imagine. So right now it's a matter of just picking and choosing where we're going to have the most uh, synergies with our core demographic, which is going to be um, specific to what our brand speaks to. Um, being a premium play, premium ingredients, you know, obviously there's going to be certain markets we'll probably avoid initially uh, just because they won't be cost effective. But for sure there's plenty of opportunity. It's just a matter right now, of course, of being able to capitalize on those opportunities. So hence the goal of getting to break even or cash flow positive as quickly, as quickly as we can, and then uh, start lining up what the next opportunities are. And so Steve, does NGS attend any trade shows that connects with even more retailers? We do. So last year was our first foray into Natural Products Expo, which is um, arguably one of the world's largest natural products, consumer goods, um, trade shows in the country. Uh, it's a week long endeavor. It's extremely exhausting, um, and expensive, but it got us a lot of really great visibility, not only with retailers, but with other merchant teams and also the support networks. So our ability to leverage the relationship with the Swanson group, for example, is one of the groups that we use that allows us to punch above our weight when it comes to sales, insights, and management. 
um, directly resulted from face-to-face -face discussions with the with the owner and founder of that particular um, agency uh, because we were at the conference. And so there's a handful that we're looking at for next year. So in addition to Expo West, um, we're likely going to be registered and presenting and attending at the National Association of Chain Drug Stores Total Show Expo, which is a big event that they do once a year, sort of in the late summer. Uh, next year, we'll be on the East Coast. And of course, that just gives us the ability to attend a variety of different conferences that get us retail exposure. And then, of course, we have been pretty consistent um, attender, attendees of another group called the ECRM MarketGate platform, which actually goes to the extent of setting us up with 20 to 30 minute meetings one on one with the merchant teams of all the retail attendees. And last year, we had 84 meetings in three days. Um, so, again, it's exhausting, but um, all part of the um, part, part of the game. So absolutely. And as we continue to have the budget for expanding into those shows, there are international equivalents of the same. So for now, foreseeable future will be Expo West. Eventually we'll add the Expo East to that rotation. We have NECDS Total Show. There's also the organization called CHIPA, which is a lobbying organization for consumer health products in the U.S. that gets a lot of face time and helps set regulations with the FDA. They do a variety of different meetings. And so you have annual meetings where the C-suite all gets together and rubs elbows and talks stories um, and builds the network effect, which is helpful, um, all the way down through um, more retail-oriented opportunities to basically get exposure uh, and just show the world what you're doing and, and that you're real. That's a that's a requirement to some extent because there's so many of these virtual companies that don't have a physical presence. Some merchant teams will just hesitate to pick up your brand if they can't actually see your real company. So that's where the trade shows come in handy. Right, and one final question that, that's just come through. Um, is there a strong market for the products in South America? There is to some extent. So the challenge there is the price barrier. So we've we've had people approach us. And as a matter of fact, our manufacturing group that makes happy tummies for us in Florida has a fairly strong distribution um, network in South America, mainly through Brazil. Uh, and oftentimes you have to pick the zones or the territories that have the ability to be able to buy our product. Um, again, because we're a premium play, that does restrict certain markets to us. Um, and then, of course, just navigating the regulations, because every country in South America, very much like Europe, each of them have their own rules and regulations. And so we already have future access and future plans to leverage Walmart Centro Am, which is 900 Walmart owned properties throughout Central and South America. Um, that gives us the ability to do a much easier import component to get our product on shelf. Uh, and then there's going to be future efforts to tap into Brazil, to tap into South Africa, to tap into a variety of different areas where the um, regions have the ability to support a premium brand. Great. Well, thanks, Steve. That looks like we've answered all the questions. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for the questions today and for Steve for joining us. Um, should we have missed anything, please feel free to reach out via the contact details at the bottom of our ASX releases. And we look forward to hosting you again soon.